Hey everyone, CyberCDH here. Hope you're doing really well. So in this video today, we're going to take a look at JNLP files. Well, what on earth are they? These stand for Java Network Launch Protocol files, and these can be pretty tasty. They're basically XML files, just plain old text files, but they can be used to launch applications from remote web server locations on your local client. And so in this case, we're going to go from a malicious JNLP file that's going to lead us to a JAR file I'm going to show you how to decompile a jar file and that in turn is going to lead us to a malicious executable which has got some tricks up its sleeve where it tries to evade security controls now jnlp files they can be extremely bad news if you look after security in your organization i suggest you take a look at your logs your email logs your web logs etc if you have any of these in your environment i suggest you take a further look now i'm pleased to say that this video is sponsored by malwarebytes privacy this is a product I really, really believe in. It's a VPN product, which is super fast, super secure, and puts you in control of your privacy. It's essential if you're analyzing malware like we are today, that you use a VPN to protect your operational security, protect your identity. But also your day-to-day -day browsing, if you care about your privacy, and if you want to protect against unauthorized tracking, then use Malwarebytes privacy. You can also bundle Malwarebytes Privacy with their device security app, and this will help protect your devices from phishing, from ransomware, from malware attacks as well. You can secure five devices under a single license. It's perfect for you, perfect for your family as well. Check out the link in the description to this video. Find out more about how you can protect your privacy with Malwarebytes. Right, we've got lots to cover today. We've got malicious JNLP files, we're gonna decompile some jar files, we're gonna unpack an executable, and we're gonna get right into the ribs of the code as well. So let's dive right in. Okay, so let's get going. We're gonna take a look at this JNLP file and here's the original blog post where I picked up this particular sample. You should definitely have a look at blogs on isc.sans.edu. They tend to be super current and very interesting indeed. And so they share the copy of the JNLP file and they also talk about the analysis here of the underlying JAR file that we're gonna take a look at as well. And I've got a copy of the JNLP here in my text editor. So it's just a little bit easier to read with a bit of syntax highlighting as well. So we can see it's actually, I don't really understand the format of JNLP and I don't really have to in this particular case which is quite nice because we can see some key plain text indicators here we've got a URL secure.read.net and we've also got delivery.jnlp and at the bottom here the href of delivery.jar no doubt that's going to be what is returned to us when we hit that particular URL and then the main class which is probably going to get invoked here is secure document reader so super simple when we look at these files and as I said earlier these are really simple file types, but in terms of what they can do, extremely powerful. It's gonna pull down for this particular file from a remote location and executes it on the underlying host. If there's Java installed, this means this is a potentially cross-platform piece of malware. So we're looking for delivery.jar, and also they share that sample within the write-up from sans.edu. And so I've grabbed a copy of that as well from Reverse It. And so what we're actually gonna do is decompile this jar file. And so the tool of choice to do that is, is JD GUI. JD GUI is awesome because you can just simply drag and drop a jar file onto it and it will decompile the code for you. We can see that secure document reader.class and we can see we've got all of the code here. So I'll copy that out, put that into my text editor again, nice bit of syntax highlighting to make it a bit easier to read here. We can see we've got a string variable being declared which is C program data video drive.exe. We can see the main function, which is invoked, calls this particular routine, Frisco 415, passes it a network URL indicator here. And we can see that all that happens is a file is created at that particular location, that linkage nine location. And then that URL is requested and the contents of that URL is written into that file. The handles are closed. And then you can see a call at the bottom here, get desktop.open local file. So that file is going to be invoked by this particular jar file as well. Super simple for us to get our teeth into. So what does it return? Okay, so I've got a copy of videodrive.exe here in my downloads folder. And the first thing you should do with any malware binary is put it into PE Studio. So you can do some very quick, easy malware initial assessment. This is a great tool and I love it. And you can see here by doing so, we can see straight away the signature of this malware suggests it's packed with UPX. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, super easy to unpack this one because you can just run UPX-D 
and unpack the malware. Well, we try that and look what happens. We actually get an error. It looks like the bad guys have meddled with the process a little bit, so we can't actually use UPX itself to unpack this malware and we need a different method. Okay, so you're probably thinking now we need to do some manual unpacking, put the malware into a debugger, find out what's going on with the UPX stuff and do some dumping of the process. And you could do that, absolutely. But I like to make life easy for myself, if I'm honest with you. And so I've got a great utility for you to have in your arsenal. This is unpack.me and you should definitely get this in your life. If you're struggling or you want to learn more about unpacking malware, definitely check these guys out on YouTube as well. But they have an amazing tool. Unpack me, you feed it a file, it'll unpack it for you and spit out the results. So it's exactly Exactly what I'm going to do here. I'm going to drag and drop videodrive.exe. I'm going to wait for this to unpack. Right, so now we have the unpacked child. Let's get this bad boy into our lab again, start doing some code analysis and see what is going on with this malware. Okay, so we've now got our unpacked malware here in our lab. And what we're gonna do is run the malware in conjunction with process monitor, quick filter for where the process name is unpacked, get that going and we'll double click the malware just to get it off and running. And if we have a look here, we can see it loads a bunch of DLLs, does some usual registry stuff, but nothing really happens straight away in this malware, which is pretty boring, really. And so we want to find out what it's doing, what it's thinking about. If you have a look in Process Hacker here, we can see that the malware is ticking away. But what's it up to? Um, and we can't really tell from this behavioral and activity because it's not writing anything to disk, not calling out back home on the internet or anything like that just yet. Uh, so what we can do, let's just stop our capture here and actually we'll kill the process in Process Hacker, let's terminate that. And we'll use X32 DBG to disassemble and debug the malware. And so let's just run to the entry point. And so the first thing I like to do when I put malware in a debugger is to have a look for the intermodular calls. These are the API calls that the malware is making. And there's two here that stick out at me. To give you an idea here of the flow of the code, what the kind of code is up to. And these two calls in kernel 32, create file mapping, a map view of file stick out at me. And create file mapping will create a file mapping object for a particular file. And map view of file will then map that particular file mapping object into this address space. So essentially you're gonna tell it what file you want and it will go and get it from disk and it will map the contents of that file into memory. So that's really interesting. I wanna know what file it's mapping into the memory here. So let's double click, go to the code, and we can see here the call to cre create file mapping. There's a few parameters that get pushed. Firstly, in EDI is the handle to the file that's going to be mapped, the mapping object. And then the second one is the actual map view of file itself. This is going to get return the actual file mapping into the address space here. So let's run the code. We get to create file mapping, and we can see here in EDI, so we see push EDI is the handle to the file. So we can see stored in EDI at the moment is OX34. Let's go to Process Hacker. Let's find the process and let's have a look at handles for OX34. And we can see it's kernel32.dll. And then what's going to happen if we watch this window as well, let's move to the next jump here, go back and we can see the section here, kernel32.dll. OX38 is now the handle and we can see that in EAX here, the same handle, OX38. So it's now mapped a copy of kernel 32 from disk into memory. And what the malware is actually doing here, it's about to iterate through all of the exported functions and compare the first byte of each function with either an E9 or FF byte instruction. 
Now, E9 or FF are jumps in x86 language. And so it's going to look to see whether or not there is a jump in the API call in the function itself that's mapped in memory. And it's going to compare that to the version that's on disk that is just mapped itself. So it's going to do a copy of the kernel 32 library it's imported versus the kernel 32 library that's written to disk. And the reason why it's doing that is because it wants to know whether the API calls, the function exports in kernel 32, have been hooked by security controls, such as antivirus or a sandbox. And if we scroll down our code a little bit here, we can see there's a couple of comparisons where this particular code takes place. Here is a comparison. Compare AL with E9 and compare AL with FF. And so if we do a little breakpoint here, on one of these and we'll run to that we can see that here is the api call in kernel 32 and it's going to go through them all and it's going to load them perform that comparison to see whether or not the exported function contains a jump instruction as the first byte which would indicate that this particular api call is being hooked by a security control and then it's going to unhook itself it's going to copy back into memory the actual version from disk. So it gets a clean copy of that particular function call. Really stealthy piece of malware. So when we're sat there watching it and waiting for it to do something in our behavioral analysis, well, you can imagine it's got a lot of functions to do that comparison across. Kernel 32 is a big library, and no doubt it's going to do it across multiple libraries as well. So it's got a bit of work to do. So maybe we should just give it some time in our behavioral analysis and then see what it does. So I'm going to close my debugger and then we're going to run it again, give it a bit more time and let's see what we can find in Process Hacker and also in Process Monitor. All right, now it looks like the malware has played the game, done something different, and we've got an awful lot of stuff to go into. Now we can see actually the private bytes in Process Hacker, a couple of meg versus a few hundred kilobytes as per previous. And we can also, what I'd probably do is poke around the memory. Let's have a look at the strings in memory and see what's changed. And so we can see here, avg hook a.dll, avg hook x.dll. If you do a bit of Googling and you find these, you'll notice that there's a few write-ups related to Sandboxy, the Sandbox as well. So maybe this malware is looking to see whether it's in Sandboxy and trying to evade detection, or even if it's just targeting AVG itself. Who knows? You can dive into deeper and let me know. Also, it's always useful to scroll down, have a look and see what interesting strings we can find from memory. DIR watch, API log DLL, all these kind of DLLs, interesting names, interesting IOCs and IOAs here that we've got ourselves as well. But it'd be good to get some network indicators and we can start to see we have some here and we can see we've got a C2, this HTTPS connection, this hetacosupportcenter.com. We've managed to get ourselves now an effective C2 that you would use to block in your environment to protect yourself against this particular malware. Now, you know, looking on Virus Total, this malware looks like it's as a role info stealer. No doubt it's stealing data, credentials, etc., from the underlying system. And this would be the C2 it's talking back to. So interesting tricks it's got up its sleeve there that we've seen where it's unhooking itself from security controls. That's a really novel technique. I haven't seen that too often, I'll be honest with you. So keep that in mind for next time. When you come across samples that appear to be quite stealthy and also if you come across samples that don't appear to be doing much when you first run them well maybe they're hard at work trying to unhook themselves from the security controls so there you go interesting interesting sample really good techniques there we've gone from 
JNLP files, we've gone a jar file, malicious executable, we've unpacked it, we've done some basic analysis and we've managed to pull out the key network indicator of compromise and found the tricky tactics that the bad guys are using to evade security detection. Hope you enjoyed this video. Big thanks to Malwarebytes for sponsoring this video as well. It's a great product. Check out Malwarebytes Privacy. If you're analyzing malware like this, you definitely need to be using a VPN to protect your operational security. Also as well, for your day-to-day -day browsing, for you, your friends, your family, get Malwarebytes Privacy in your life and also take a look at the bundle you can get with the device security app as well. Protect five devices under a single license from ransomware, from phishing, from malware, all of that bad stuff will give you the confidence to browse safely online. Thank you for sponsoring the video. Thank you for sticking with me. If you want to join in the conversation, you can follow me on Twitter at CyberCDH. And I really welcome your questions and comments. Stay healthy and I'll see you next time.